right, hello and welcome everyone to the third installment of the Atlantic Vernacular Artist Talks. Um, I am excited to have you all here now and also in the future as this video will be available for viewing for the duration of the project. Um, today we are going to have a little overview of the Atlantic Vernacular Project, which you can do at atlanticvernacular.ca. Um, we are going to hear about its special connection with Fundy National Park, and we'll also watch a video of one of the artists in her dye garden, and she will introduce us to all kinds of amazing plants um, that she works with. And um, after that, we're going to have an interview with uh, two of the artist collaborators. But before we can actually get started, um, we must have our land acknowledgement, and for that, I'm going to throw it to um, our poet for the evening, uh, Kayla Geitzler. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thank you. Tonight, we are broadcasting from within Willostaqui traditional territory and Siknik of the Mi'kmaq, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq people, to celebrate the work of regional craftspeople, artists, and poets. Let us remember that this region, called Atlantic Canada, where we live, work, and create, are lands that, by law, by the treaties of peace and friendship, are the unceded territories of the Wabanaki peoples the lands of the Mi'kmaq, Wolostaquiak, and Passamaquoddy First Nations. We are grateful for the friends joining us from across Turtle Island and beyond to honor our vital voices, words, and artworks, especially those of Wolostaquiak, Mi'kmaq, and Passamaquoddy, and all peoples in our shared artistic and literary landscapes. May we all work to untie the binds and violence of colonialism May we live and create with respect on the land, and may we live and create in peace and friendship with all its people. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I'm Alison Murphy. I'm the executive director of Craft ND, and I'm here this evening just to tell you a little bit about how Craft NB and Atlantic Vernacular and the artists and the poets ended up in Fundy National Park and our relationship um, between Craft NB and the the in Fundy National Park and Parks Canada. Um, so for us, it all started in 2016 as an organization. We went to Fundy National Park trying to think about how we could really push the crafts community into learning new things and working in new ways and seeing outside of their typical um, way of working. And Fundy was extremely receptive. They were excited about working with us because it allowed them to, to gain access to new audiences and be represented in new ways. Um, and it was this kind of wonderful planning phase, 2016, 2017, as we kind of decided on how we were going to do this. And in 2017, we launched Beneath the Surface, which is our residency program that we run in Fundy National Park every two years, or it should be every two years. COVID has kind of changed things a little bit, but um, that's traditionally how we would do things. So for the Beneath the Surface residency, we bring 20 artists from across New Brunswick and the Maritimes, anybody who's a member of Craft NB and who applies and is juried and selected for the, for the program. Um, and we spend one week in Fundy uh, with park interpreters. We do all kinds of fun things from night hikes to salamander catching to playing with seaweed and beach walks and all kinds of wonderful exploration. Um, and I think one thing that we didn't realize going into this was how amazing and impactful the interpreters in Fundy National Park were going to be and how much of an influence they were going to have on the artists and the work that came out the other end. So after the artists have spent their week with us there, they would go home, have a few months to make work, and then the work would tour the province and uh, go to different galleries in New Brunswick and be able to represent Fundy and bridge the gap and have kind of art it, craft as a way of of exploring and explaining the experience they'd had in funding the things they had learned there 
So the plan had been to go back and do this residency again in 2019 with Fundy National Park, um, or no, in we went back in 2019. Sorry, we did. We pl the initial plan started in 2016. We went in 2017. It was this wonderful experience. We went back again in 2019. We had another wonderful experience. And the plan was then to go back in 2021. Uh, but COVID really had other plans for us. And we were unable to do that in the way that we had kind of anticipated prior to the pandemic. So in 2020, we'd been working on Atlantic Vernacular. It was going to be an exhibition that we toured around the province. And then when everything kind of blew up and we all had to jump to digital solutions, the exhibition moved into that realm of, yes, okay, we really want to move forward with this. It's really important. We're excited to be working with poets as well as craftspeople. Um, but how is this going to fit into uh, this new digital world? And then also what's going to happen with our relationship with Fundy and like, how can we still have them involved? So the conversation was kind of ongoing with Fundy about how they could still be a part of this, even though it wasn't what we had anticipated doing. And you'll see this evening um, the results of that, where we took craftspeople and poets to Fundy National Park and spent time with the interpreters there, exploring and seeing the landscape and learning and, and doing all that wonderful stuff that then goes through the wheels of creativity and comes out the other end as, as these wonderful um, products of that experience. And so that is um, a part of the Atlantic Vernacular Exhibition is this work that came from um, our connection to Fundy, the time we spend in Fundy and the wonderful park interpreters that have shared their knowledge so generously and their enthusiasm. Um, it's uh, We are endlessly grateful for the relationship that we have with Fundy National Park and are looking forward to getting back to uh we're doing the beneath the surface residency again this fall so keep your eyes out for that so we're looking forward to getting back there again soon but for this evening i hope you really enjoy what um has come from that relationship and learn a little bit more about that thank you you're muted here. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone. Uh, so I was just explaining that we're doing a little technical switcheroo at the moment. Um, well, Ali signs off and we welcome Dan Sinclair. And while that's going on, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our generous funders and contributors. Uh, so thank you to the Canada Council for the Arts. Thank you also to the province of New Brunswick and in particular, the Department of Tourism, Heritage and Culture. Um, thank you to Parks Canada and in particular, Fundy National Park. Thank you, Fatima Pagdawala, Ali Murphy, and Stillwell, Rihanna Howard, Emily Ryu, our web designer, K Casey Wilcox, um, and the genius uh, tech of all of our online events, uh, Nandi Call. Uh, we'd also like to thank Sarah Sardi, who provided a lot of the documentation um, for of the artwork for the website. And um, thank you to the artists who are participating tonight, uh, Kayla Geitzler and Renata Brutez. Um, and with that, if we're ready, I'd like to hand it over to Dan Sinclair. Hello, greetings from uh, Fundy National Park, right here on the Bay of Fundy um, in a little corner of southeastern uh, New Brunswick. So my name is Dan Sinclair, and I'm the interpretation supervisor here in Fundy. And oh, it's been a blast to work with Craft NB ever since they approached us about collaborating and working together. Um, Allison kind of said, that they didn't know what to expect and and what to, what they were going to get from us and I would say the exact same thing for us we didn't know what to expect when working with a with a great group of of artists through the beneath the surface and now with the Atlantic vernacular as well um, it's been a pleasure to kind of work with um, every group that comes through and and provide a little or or to offer them um, a little glimpse of what we do in protecting and presenting um uh this little piece of new brunswick um so to give a little glimpse at kind of what we do um and how we work with craft new brunswick um through the beneath the surface and and craft and with the atlantic vernacular as well is is provide a, a venue for 
for inspiration. And if you've ever been to a national park or even just in the woods behind your house or in your community, um, you find inspiration in nature. And that is what we continually try to do and try to uh, foster connection as well. And it's been um, exciting to work with the artists um, and the craftspeople and now the poets as well to provide that inspiration and actually see it um, become something. Often when we work with visitors, excuse me, visitors or, or even school groups or other groups, um, we provide inspiration, we provide a venue, um, we may provide connection, um, but then they go off and we never really encounter them again. Um, but now to actually see that inspiration become something is, is really special to see um, uh, through, through um, whatever medium um, happens. And so uh, when creating kind of that inspiration or that venue here, um, it's, it's basically creating a space, a safe space to explore, to ask questions, to present. Um, through Beneath the Surface, we provide opportunities and outings with, uh, with, uh, with uh, our, our researchers or with our interpreters and other knowledgeable folks. Um, but for Atlantic Vernacular, we had such a, a small window. It was, I think, three overnights, four days, or maybe even less. Um, and in the fall, which we'd never offered a program in the fall, beneath the surface had always been traditionally in the spring. And and now it's going to be in the fall. So I'm really excited about what we're, what we're planning this year as well. But for the fall, it was trying to provide a venue or, or a glimpse of new things or, or little corners of the park that hadn't been um, showcased before. The beach is always uh, a great venue. And we went to the beach with nothing planned. Um, I think there was some conversations and it was a great to kind of sit down and chat with everybody and got a glimpse of kind of what they were thinking or where their, where their backgrounds are coming from as well. So we can provide connection that way. Um, I think the highlight, I won't go through our entire itinerary because uh, some of it might be replicated uh, for beneath the surface. So I don't want to provide too much of a glimpse, but to me, the highlight of our outings um, accumulated in something that was not planned. Um, we were doing a virtual school program on the banks of the Upper Salmon River. Um, it was scheduled before this, so I kind of just tied it all in together and said, join us on the river. We'll explore the river after we're done this virtual presentation. Um, it happened to be about salmon, the Inner Bay of Fundy Atlantic salmon, which is an endangered species. And it all kind of slowly tied into um, uh, it tied into an experience that I think none of us will forget, where uh, our resource conservation staff needed to release some salmon during the virtual presentation. I thought maybe six salmon. Um, there was about 40 or 50 salmon that needed to be released. So everybody participating, artists, poets, everybody um, got to physically release a salmon back into their natural environment, back into their natural stream, um, uh, behind the scenes of all this virtual stuff happening. And then afterwards, we got to sit down along the banks of the river with some of the resource conservation folks um, who do salmon work, but um, the salmon were all jumping, which in my feeling would have been the first time in, in a very long time, maybe even a hundred years since salmon have been jumping in that river so plentifully. Uh, so to, to share that experience and then to actually see that become something um, in poetry, in, in craft as well, has been uh, amazing to see. And, and I share it with all my colleagues across the network as well, um, of how working with artists creates um, a different experience and a different vantage point as well. Um, and we look forward to beneath the surface uh, this fall. So it's always great working with with everyone. I can't wait to see what um, what our artist friends and our poet friends um, say this evening as well. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, and I hope it's okay, Nandi. I'm going to go a little off script and just quickly share my screen um, because I want to share this uh website where folks can see more about um the atlantic vernacular project so just bear with me okay so here it is um and first you go to atlanticvernacular.ca and in particular i wanted to highlight the fundy project so right along the top bar you'll see um, an indicator for the fundy project and if you click on that that you can hear you can read more about the project 
but you can also see some fantastic photos of the experience that the artist shared, as well as the uh, result of the artist collaborations that happened on this very special excursion. So the work's just incredible. And um, last but not least here, we've got uh, Kayla and Renata's piece. Um, and so that is a durational piece. It's a video. Um, so I'd invite you when we're done our talk to go and check that out. It's a few minutes long. Um, and oops, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But yeah, so just if you're looking for the particulars about the Fundy project, please go to Atlantic, AtlanticVernacular.ca and click on the Fundy project on the top bar and you will see um, everything you need to. And I closed that. I'm, I'm no longer sharing the screen, right? I just want to check. Okay, no one says I am. So, okay, cool, all good. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so I just want to give an overview of the project uh, in case we have anyone in the audience who hasn't um, taken in the Atlantic Vernacular Project yet. Um, it's a really, uh, for me, a very exciting project where we brought together um, artists, uh, artisans, crafts people of many different um, strokes, and they responded to the theme of Atlantic vernacular. So we put together a call and all of the artists with whom it resonated submitted some really fantastic work. Um, it was not an easy selection process, but we did it. And then all of those artists' works were paired with um, poets also of uh, the Atlantic region. And as we say of, because we have some folks who are um, from other parts of the country, um, but still wanting to respond um, to work from this region, as well as uh, some of the crafts, um, craft work came from other parts of the country as well, but was focused on um, that regional kind of Atlantic voice. Um, our poetry advisors, Sue Sinclair and Jenna Lynn Albert worked with Craft and Bee, the, work, uh, the Craft and Bee team, as well as with um, Fatima Pagdawala, who is the project coordinator for Atlantic Vernacular. Um, and they reached out to the poets and helped create those pairings. And so in, in every way, um, there's a collaborative element throughout this entire project. Um, and then with the Fundy excursion, um, the artists and poets paired up specifically to respond. So they generated a brand new artwork um, from, from that experience. Um, so again, you can view the entire exhibition at atlanticvernacular.ca. Um, we wanted to capture a shared region, regional voice and all of its diversity with this project. Uh, we were thrilled with the variety of work that made it into the exhibition, and we wanted to showcase the spectrum of uh, contemporary craft from this region. Poems were, we invited the poets to write in their mother tongue um, and recite them likewise. So not only can you read the poems that pair with the artworks, but you can listen to them read by the poets themselves. Um, and English uh, appears subsequent um, to the, the mother tongue of all of the poets. Um, and, all right, and this exhibition will be up for a year total. So we're, almost three quarters of the way through. Um, it, it went up in March last year, so it'll be up until then um, with the website being live and everything. And, and actually you'll be able to access it for another couple of years, but it'll be archived at that point. So it'll be uh, within the Craft and Bee site after that. Um, okay, so joining me today are the duo, uh, visual artists Renata Brutez and poet uh, Kayla Geitzler. And so I've just got in the background um, playing a slideshow, both of Renata's work as well as Kayla's. Um, Kayla is from Moncton, New Brunswick, with Skinnick, sorry, within Skinnick of the, of the Mi'kmaq, where she works as an editor and writing consultant and proudly represents her city as its first Anglophone poet laureate. She was named a Rad Woman of Canadian Poetry, and she also hosts the Attic Owl Reading Series um, in Moncton. Her first book, That Light Feeling Under Your Feet, was a finalist for two poetry awards, and she is the co-editor of Cadence Female Voices, as well as being a, a columnist for the Miramichi Reader. She recently edited Virago, Warrior Woman, Inspirational Life Stories by Influential Trinidadian Women, Kayla holds a uh, master's in English creative writing, and her writing has been published um, internationally. And um, if you Google Kayla, you can find 
um, a sneaky sample of her book and it's um, really fantastic poetry um, and quite versatile as well um, in its forms. Secondly, um, her collaborator, Renata Brites. Um, Renata is a Brazilian Canadian multidisciplinary artist based in Fredericton, New Brunswick. In 2019, she graduated from the textile design program at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design. The following year, she completed the advanced studio practice program at the same institution. Her work has been shown in exhibitions throughout the Maritimes and um, Brites also owns her own gallery, which uh, we'll get to see a little bit of in the upcoming video. Uh, she experiments with natural dyes, printing and felting te techniques to make two-dimensional and sculptural pieces. She explores important themes in her textile-based projects. She is critical of the harmful practices of industrial textile production and draws attention to this in her work. She deliberately uses organic materials and low impact processes to create her product line. Her environmental concerns are also evident in her sculptural works. Brutez has shared her expertise in several textile workshops around the region. She's now an instructor at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design. In her mixed media works, Renata, um, sorry, Brutez invites us to reflect on our human interactions with and impacts on the natural world. So um, last week, Renata, graciously uh, allowed me to come and film in her dye garden. So we'll watch uh, a short video of that visit um, now. So yeah, so uh, this garden was made for natural dyes and the purpose is to educate people what, uh, what we can use here and uh, in New Brunswick. Uh, so everything was, uh, has a purpose in the garden. And uh, so starting here, for example, we have the Coreopsis, uh, which are great for dyes. They have beautiful orange and yellows. Um, they actually go into seed now, but that's great because it's also uh, serve uh, for us to save the seed so we can have a garden again. Uh, so we will be sustainable in that way too. So this is one, a very common one that most of the gardens have, which is the uh, Black Eye Susan or Rubacius, and they are also really great for dyes and for print. Uh, it's something that you, I'm sure you have in your backyard and uh, you can start to work with natural dyes this way. So coming around this section, they are all dahlias. Um, the, uh, some of them are all coming up, uh, but they will be uh, ready soon as well. They give uh, more like a yellow dyes and I use most of them for the leaves, for the printing process. And uh, in here, and you see some calendula here, and they all go into seed, which mm. is nice. And most of them they self seed it themselves, which is good for us, so we don't have to have a lot of work. But we definitely collect them, and uh, the goal is to share with the community as well once uh, we have the garden a little bit more established. Uh, um, Yarrow has medicinal and also dye components. Uh, they are in season right now, so you probably see them on your lawns. Some people even like treat them as weeds, but they are great for dyes, very strong yellow dye. Of course, the star of the shows, they are always has to be the marigolds. Uh, they are a must if you want to create a dye garden. They are super easy to maintain. They grow in pretty much any soil and they are readily available uh, in most of the nurseries. And again, they have a great medicinal uh, purposes, but also a beautiful dye, very strong golden yellow. And uh, the good thing about them, you, you just peek away, just have that had them and they will self seed, but they will also bring more blooms. So uh, what it's a good idea to do in your garden too, is just to have the dead heading thing. And again, more uh, calendula here. And this here is actually the seeds and something that's very easy to collect. So you can uh, have a sustainable garden. You can grow uh, from your own seeds. So you do the next year garden with your seeds. Uh, and in here you have the common daisy, which some people might even think they are weeds. Uh, I haven't grown those. They just came and I just let them be, <laughs> <laughs> which is a good thing. And they're great for dying and friends. Uh, this one is going to be a very exciting one in a couple weeks. That's a Hopi um, sunflower. Mm -hmm. This is well known by the Hopi people, uh, the Central American uh, Native people. They grew that on their culture and the 
inner part of the flower, the seeds are very rich in dye. So they're beautiful black and purple dye and that's uh, not local, but it, it, I'm excited to be able to grow in from, from the seeds and be able to harvest this time as well. Uh, here is a very exciting one. Uh, this is Matter, which is the, uh, the real red. Uh, from the royal times and they are originally from India but the interesting part of this plant is actually the roots so I just grew this year so it's gonna take me three years to harvest this plant and it will just grow like you see now and the winter comes the wolver enter winter and will grow some more and on the third year of this plant I'll be able to to harvest to create the, the reds and the oranges mm. from the uh, from the true red that we see in nature and that's one of the very famous plants and well-known in natural dyes so that's exciting mm. and uh, moving along in here another exciting one to be able to grow in our zone which it's not uh, natural uh, those are the eucalyptus so that's a lemon eucalyptus uh, this don't overwinter it's annual for us uh, but has again Beautiful properties for medicinal purposes, but as well for dyes. Very strong red orange dye, and of course the ones that you probably seen on the uh, grocery stores or in the flower shops. That is the silver dollar one. Uh, very unique, very uh, scented, uh, which is great to use mm -hmm. when you work because you're also getting the properties, uh, the medicinal properties from the scent. But this is, again, for us, is an annual, but it's just super exciting to be able to grow this from a seed. It's a very uh, slow grow one. Uh, we're starting in January, February, uh, to get to a stage that we can put it uh, just here in the ground in the spring. And it grows a little bit, so we harvest and it keeps growing. But, uh, but yeah, it's just exciting to be able to, yeah, just empowering to be able to grow from, from seed and be able to harvest and work with that, which is the most important thing for me too. Um, again, some more beautiful yarrow. That's basically part of my lawn and I just <laughs> let them be. Again, a very exciting uh, bat in here. This is uh, the blues and the purples of the natural dyes. So in here, uh, you see that's wold. Wold is a, uh, one of the Saxon blues and um, French blues as well, very known in Europe. Uh, this is being, will be harvested soon and the leaves will give a very teal and blue color. Um, this is a biennial for us, uh, so this is the first year plant. Uh, they usually give dye only on the first year, so that's my chances to harvest in a couple <laughs> weeks. And uh, la next year they will grow in spring and they create beautiful pods, uh, seed pods that again will just continue the gardening uh, that way, which is exciting. Um, and in here is the star, another star of the show, that's indigo. And you can see by the coloration of the leaves, uh, some of them are really ready to harvest. And I will try to show you if I can see that. Uh, if I start to really rubber, it, it depends on oxygen to, uh, to have the oxidation process and we start to turn dark and will become blue eventually but sometimes, as you can see, the color is already changing on the, the leaf. So it does, oh, that's another perfect example that's already been oxidized for us. So you can Ooh. see the hues of blue, that's the, the indigo pigment uh, being exposed into the air and uh, just creating this beautiful blue that's also in my hand. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so those two plants are the natural blues that you find in nature very unique on their own but they both have uh, indigo uh, pigment on their on the structure and uh, it's just exciting to be able to grow in here in our zone again there will be annual for us but it's worth it the it's worth the work <laughs> to be able to harvest and create from scratch i think that's a uh, very important for me and also to to be able to share with the community uh, the education and what the what plants can do for us and uh yeah, that's uh, if you want to come, bye. Uh, we are here on Henwell Road. Thank you very much, Renata, for um, hosting me for that video. And uh, I think a lot of people are really 
um, natural dye curious. So hopefully that's either ignited more curiosity or sated it a little bit, but um, yeah, it was really, really great to see what's going on in your garden. Um, and thank you both for collaborating basically twice um, for this project. Uh, the first time, um, Kayla, you responded to Renata's work and the second time you to conceptualize something entirely together. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about um, those two experiences. But um, I was struck when I was talking to you folks about this interview and what, wondering whether you had questions for each other. And uh, Kayla, you said, you know, I think we actually um, think about art in some similar ways or similar ways of working. And I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that because I, I think that's fantastic. Well, it's been a little while, so Hanata is going to probably have to to fill in the gaps that I'm I'm going to miss. And to like visual art and poetry, like there's always crossover between arts, but mm. still they're you know they're their own things. Um, you know, it's really cool to like meet Hanata and connect, and like we just we just clicked, and it was really amazing. And you know, we had the salmon release, and like all of these great things that informed our walk or our walk our um, our art, like the night walk that we that Dan took us on. Um, so like, I think we were talking a lot about, um, like what Hanata does and like, well, how do you interact with, because she had the land is part of what she does. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, while it inspires me, it, it sometimes it's harder for language to do that. Right. You have to find those instances of it in the natural world. So I was like, tell me about dyes. And so we talked about saturation and like how things, you know, absorb other things and you know what roots are like versus rocks and plants and um and then we got talking about time and the tides and cycles and things like that and um right how time is like water there's that idea where it's all encompassing and it flows and it doesn't stay but it goes backwards and forwards and so like it really challenges all of our conceptions of how you know science in fact really defines those those things that we think we know when we don't right and you know and like Hanata had said too when she goes to her workshop and she works with the dyes doesn't always turn out how she likes or how she expects and that's the same thing with poetry and I think that sort of collaborative process with our our language or our our materials whatever they may be is part of it um, art helps define what we do there's a collaborative process within that and I think the things that really help an audience connect with what we do is part of that mm -hmm. um, it shapes right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely um, yeah and I and I think too um sorry <laughs> Um, Kayla really did. I, I just found it was amazing and I so appreciate it that she did that. She tried to incorporate, even though it's not her mother tongue, the Portuguese, and just um, not only by the meaning, but the sounds, which I feel that was really important in poetry, but as well as colors important to me um, uh, on my, my visual practice. And uh, I just feel so grateful that she, she went ahead and decided to work with the sounds and uh, with the idea of the word being really who we are and that's how we feel. It's not English being my my first language and just having this little piece, especially in the, our first collaboration, uh, it really did the trick and really brought it home. Uh, and it was just a perfect match for, for the piece because it was all about uh, where really home is and home is what you, uh, you know, not mm -hmm. only the physicality of the space, but also um, you and how you find yourself uh, in the home that you are. But language is such a strong part of who you are um, and how this translates and using the Portuguese in her poetry, I just found it was really unique and also very grateful that you decided to go uh, on that too. So appreciate that. And uh, moving with the, uh, the second piece, I just found it was so important to have Kayla's, um, you know, like she said, it was just like, sometimes it doesn't, you know, it's 
our piece and it comes something else that's it, it's just it's part of hers and my work together and it just even though we had different perspectives and different ideas about time and different takes i just felt that somehow they just create a perfect marriage between uh the poetry and the, the visual and uh, the felt piece yes so i think that's why it's like really quick <laughs> we are very lucky with that it's, yeah. you both really that. Nice that there's something um really neat about the exchange too where the poetry helps animate the artwork um through a different lens but similarly the artwork helps animate the poetry too um and i would say even with the, your fundy piece there's almost like a third collaborate collaborator which um was fundy was like yeah absolutely. immersed in um yeah and you both had like a sensitivity to that and i yeah i really appreciate it um for folks who want to check out the piece if you haven't seen it yet um the soundscape that was incorporated mm -hmm. um so it's um actually yeah why don't you describe what it was made of um Renata? yeah sure um so the piece basically um it was meant to be an installation so like really an experience what people could at least um bring themselves back to a certain period of time or even uh bring them back to a memory or to something that's you know a point in time that they wouldn't forget with that we're often on this routine and this hamster wheel that we all are we forget about feelings we forget about our loved ones and we just go and um but anyway so the exhibition it, it turned out to be online so i i did my best in trying to to recreate a moment mm -hmm. that we um spend doing our time in fundy and trying to recreate that so that's a piece that's uh, hopefully, um, for me, we're definitely going to bring memories and going to bring uh, things mm -hmm. about the time that I spent there, but not only my time and hopefully it could be somebody else's time or really any that will bring a memory or something that a uh, relationship with it through the poetry or even through the images, through the sea or through the nature or just bring back mm -hmm. this um, Living the moment and the Carpentian uh, thing. Um, so the piece is meant to be almost like a frame, like almost like a painting on the on a wall, but it's animated with video. So that's why the installation. So we have the sound and the um, a little short videos that I took through my ears in funding and experiencing uh, with my my experience with Fundy uh, and the Atlantic um, Ocean and. Uh, um, and, and the sounds that I was able to in different points of periods of time that I being uh, in touch with that beautiful and magical region. And I think Kayla was, you know, beautiful poetry was just the match that we needed to really uh, also bring us back to really uh, what we how we disconnect how we got disconnected and in many different mm -hmm. layers of our lives or in relationships or with nature or with ourselves and i feel that was something very important to address and uh there was something that was just very lucky to to mm -hmm. have uh poetry to complement the piece yeah well, it was so cool how everything came together because for me, there's always some anxiety if I'm writing for someone else or trying to honor something. I have, you know, do I, did I do it? You know, you, you never really know as an artist, did I do it, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, when she put everything together and there were the bird calls, the poetry echoed everything. And I was like, this is so great. And, you know, and it, I've shared it with a lot of people and they all say the same thing because it, it accomplishes what Hanata and I were trying to do, which is like, you have to just disconnect from life as it is and you're there and people all say oh I think about my family members or I think about memories or you know all those things and it's like I'm looking into another world but it's a world I know or it's my world or right they're they're completely reconnected in a very different way yeah I think it would be really cool for you folks to like um apply that piece to other exhibitions as well just because I yeah it's, it's a real contribution for sure and um I want to sort of hook onto that word that Renata mentioned of layers, because there are all these layers, like the visible and invisible, um, the felt uh, and perceived um, that, um, mm -hmm. and also just the sound. <laughs> um, and so, but then there's also the formal layers as well. So we've got the layer of cloth and the layer of video. Um, 
And yeah, that like the, there's something working really nicely within all of that. Um, and so Kayla, I wanted to ask you, um, because you've got this, um, poem that was, uh, uh, used to open the Fry Festival. And so you can see this uh, poetry reading on YouTube. And that was another kind of audiovisual um, mm -hmm. adventure. And so I could be wrong, but my interpretation, because you had these two different kind of major settings, was almost like there were two characters within the poem. Um, and I was curious about how these kinds of experience maybe inform um, your approach or your sort of scenarios where you'd like to have your poems live so confinement or confinement was actually um, my first project as the poet laureate in moncton and it was in the pandemic so jean philippe rash and i hadn't worked together yet we had to figure out a way to put this online and pivot in like just a couple of months and i was so stressed out because <laughs> i just opened my business six months before uh -huh. <laughs> got at a right and so and and when I realized it wasn't that I'd you know forgotten it's that my style had completely changed and shifted in a way that normally it's gradual for an artist when you go through a change but it just did it overnight and I was like what am I going to do so we had to find a way to also film in a way that was you know by the law and following all the restrictions and everything and that was another thing where we sort of like Jean-Philippe and I drank a lot of wine and we <laughs> <laughs> over zoom you know like we were like what are we gonna do because he was in the same boat they gave us the steam and they're like go with it and so um so yeah i guess there's a bunch of different you know characters and stuff that move through the poems and um and we were trying to be respectful but also to sort of tap into what that sort of mass feeling where, and then maybe even on an individual level, how do you feel being stuck at home? How do you feel, especially as an artist, um, what's most important to you? Mm -hmm. And Louis-Philippe uh, Chasson did all of the audio visual and he, he had like, they shot me from above when I did my longer poem called Contagion, which was sort of like, how do we love, right? What's really important and if it's just love and like, I wrote it for my partner, but I tried to like look at pandemics and contagions and think through history. And I really think that, especially with the music that was done by um, Sebastien Michaud and um, Denis, oh my goodness, I forgot his last, Denis said it, um, like it all sort of came together. And, you know, as an Anglophone writer, our our artistic practice is very strict and very rigid. So I was absolutely out of my element for all mm -hmm. of it. And I realized that was a good thing. And um, I think visual aspects and sound aspects are really key to poetry. I really liked all that stuff they did in the sixties where people would just get up and freak out and, you know, do whatever because it was important or they'd collaborate with visual artists. So that's what the Fry does. Mm -hmm. There's a visual kind of collaboration and it really, made me reconsider what poetry was and it made it better, I think. So mm -hmm. I hope Very that cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. And I think that I think collaboration is such yeah. a thing that we should be embracing. Um, I think especially in this region. Um, I did a very large road trip, research trip around the US a number of years ago and ended up in um, Salt Lake City in Utah. And I was just like, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is gonna be a very conservative place. And I, I couldn't have been more wrong because um because it's the major cultural center, all the like, you know, poets and artists and weirdos get together. Um yeah. and they, there's a lot of um collaboration and crossover and it makes for like this incredibly rich um cultural scene uh and then otherwise like kind of sea of conservatism um mm -hmm. of various ways. And so, yeah, I think that that's something that folks in this region are really hungry for um, is to have, yes, progressive voices, but also just to have cultural richness um, that's shared. And so, yeah, that's part of the reason I'm passionate about this project and what you yeah. folks have done with it. And um, yeah, I think, I think it's been really fruitful and I really hope that we get to see more of this kind of work and um, would love to see some of the collaborations you know, go further into the future. And um, we've already had word that that's happening at least once. <laughs> so um, so I think that that's a mark of success. So just to bring it back to you two um, and thinking about what it means to be an artist in this region, both of you um, also teach as part of your practice. Um, so Kayla, you have your own business. Um, 
where you help people write. <laughs> yeah, and publish, yeah. <laughs> Um, and Renata, you, you run uh, workshops at your own gallery as well as teaching at NBCCD. And so I was just curious for both of you, um, how, how does teaching fit into your practice? Do you see it as an extension of your practice or do you sort of compartmentalize it um, outside of it? Because everyone kind of approaches this differently. Maybe start with Renata. Sure. Okay. Um... I don't, I don't, I wouldn't put in a two different boxes. I think that is, I, most of the things that I teach, I mean, I guess the majority that I teach in the workshops, it's things that I love and things that I want to people to also love. So mm -hmm. you feel excited. So it's something, it's easy, even with the NBCCD, the courses that, uh, that I often teach are focusing entrepreneurship and crafts and how to make those kids make money with art so uh, something that I'm very passionate about it uh, and I love to share my experience and hopefully uh, guide them and uh, to be successful in their careers so either is teaching a technologies of art or my practice with natural dyes or even helping um, the next generation achieve I think that's all belongs to my practice as as an artist but also as a human and then that, that would gives meaning to my life and a reason why to still be here in this and this uh, place and uh, be able to to help community and to to help uh, the artist community as well as our community to understand and be grateful for the land uh, that we reside as well as you know work with the land not against uh, and be respectful uh, that is my goal. So with the teaching and all that. So I feel that's pretty much um, interlace with my practice and uh, as my mission as an artist and as a human. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Kayla? Yeah, it's it's quite a bit. It's like that for me too, although um, less resource based because we can do everything digitally, which is which is also great, right? So less impact on the environment. But yeah, definitely like growth and collaboration. Um, I, I don't, I don't like, like when you come to my courses, you have to talk. I want to hear your ideas. Let's talk about your opinions. Why do you think this way? And I have a very like unconventional style where I don't teach anyone how to write. I think that destroys you as an artist. You need to find your own path, you know? Yeah. And so they come and some people get confused and I'm like, I will teach you how to think like a poet or like a writer. I can show you resources. I'm going to show you that writing is not like this. It's mm -hmm. like that, you know, it just, it, and and I also learn, you know, I think you'd be a really arrogant person to say that you don't learn from your students and that you should learn, you know, it informs your practice as much it will, as it will inform theirs. And I hope that, you know, they take one or two pieces, they say, oh, Kayla taught me that and it was important, but the rest of it, whatever it is, it should eclipse me. It should just go on and become part of their practice and, and whatever, or, you know, they find other people that inspire them to... Mm -hmm. That, you know they're like oh well she was great for the basics but I want to learn <laughs> you know this one thing that I'm really passionate about right yeah. so like because we all we all grow in a community like the best artists are always you know they, they explore they take risks I try to encourage people to take a risk I try to help people and say you know like you know, you, it's it's not one thing, it's everything. What do you like to do? What do you like to listen to? You know, theory is important, learn the rules so that you can, you know, do better. Like, yeah, so, and, and there's lots of inspiring things that people share when they're brave, you know, when they're in a safe space and they're comfortable, you know, mm -hmm. you get to see who they really are. And that's the kind of connection that I'm I'm hoping that I can inspire them to give to the world or, or that sounds a little bit arrogant. That's probably not the right language, but I think you know what I mean. Like, I want to find for themselves in the world, perhaps. Right? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. you know, take the risk. Tell me what you're passionate about. What are you mm -hmm. passionate about? Develop that and give it to someone else because you'll inspire everybody else too. Like, we'll have a better human race, or, or that's the <laughs> old term. Sorry, I came back from a, a weekend <laughs> retreat. I go every couple, and my brain just sort of like goes off. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's actually a perfect segue to my last question for you both before we um, throw it over to the audience. And um, yeah, that my question for you is, you know, in your own practices, what are the questions that you ask, uh, that you either ask your audience or you ask yourself? What are your questions in your practice? Who wants to go first? I can go, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I think to me lately, I think that I was very grateful with the piece that we did because that's something that really woke me. Um, I mean, I had an accident uh, recently, a bad accident and a car accident that really makes you think your whole life, right? Like why you're here. Um, yeah, so that really what I kind of like now that's a clean slate <laughs> as i as i say um is really to f don't only produce for the sake of producing uh and us as emerging artists like we're really uh famine and in in just produce and make our names and uh be there and be there all the time so people finally you know see you uh but right now i'm not in this though this big rush anymore i always have something to say and um i feel that as a human and artist we all have this you know <laughs> willing to to be able to to produce new things but um since my practice kind of develop a little more in a sense like why am i producing uh and what i'm gonna leave uh to the world not to be <laughs> so dramatic but um <laughs> with waste or even like, you know, what's the message that I want to deal with. So to me, it comes to a lot of about materials and to be able to create as last impact as it can. But if I'm creating an impact, it has to be meaningful enough as a message to, to be able to produce or mm -hmm. create something that's ephemeral or something that you will uh, return to the land without causing as much as impact. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why I work with the natural dyes, with natural paints and things that I know that I feel responsible to putting out on the world. But I also feel responsible to when somebody buys my art, if they want to give away or if you want to, they toss in a garbage, it will still be OK. So um, so those are the questions. And I mean, not the rules that I try to follow if I'm creating something, but also the meaning and uh, what I want to say uh, to you know to the community, and that has to be meaningful, not just for the sake of create or for the sake for the next grant or for for the sake of just being the next exhibition. Uh, my goal as an artist, it's not <laughs> that anymore. I feel that's more uh, really um, taking my time and. Uh, mm -hmm produce something that's um, going to be for me, but also for uh, hopefully for somebody else that's going to be touched by that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Again, more overlap with with uh, Hanata on that. I think for yeah. me, writing is a sense of communion. And it's also like, I'm a bit of a rebel. So it's sort of like, well, why not? And screw you, you know, like, there's so many, but I mean, you'll know this too, as artists, right? There's so many opinions or restrictions or things that critics say well you must do or you can't do this or you only write this way as a woman or you only write like this in Atlanta Canada and mm -hmm. you no know, so why not and like what must I write and why and how do I write that and I find the more performance I've done the more I want to be doing like vocalizations and mm -hmm. you know I'm of like family stories and intergenerational trauma and it's like how does that go down on the page what must I write why must I write it you know what does the body have to do with writing? How does how do you push boundaries in writing by bringing art onto the page and recreating what poetry is supposed to be or supposed to look like? You know, all the restrictions that are out there, you can put those on your writing if you want, but you can also take the time and, you know, move around it, recreate, you know, the concept of what poetry or what your art means to you. So I don't really think of poetry as poetry or putting out a book every two years. I'll never do that. I don't think I, I made peace with that a long time ago. So it's not producing for the sake of producing like some people. It's it's like this is art and this is how I live. And mm -hmm. everything that's a part of me goes down on the page. So I don't really know what that gives me in the end. But I know like I've, I've met a lot of writers when my first book came out and they're like, this is your first book. This is really great. And I was like, yeah, it is my first book and I'm proud of it. Um, like I'll never look at it and go, oh, that's my first book. You know, like I'm mm -hmm. satisfied with, with how it came out. And I like to see that in writers and in artists, you know, when they go, it was my first piece. Or like when I work for the projects, like with Hanata and here, like I had to just throw everything 
out the window, I had to go, okay, it's visual art. I have to write to visual art. I have to break the rules in a very different way. Now, mm. it drove me nuts. It's like pulling my hair out. I'm like, this doesn't sound right. How do I get this there? Does this work? Does the form work? So anyway, but it's good. You should be growing and pushing yourself as an artist, I think. That's well, the show. If you feel called to do that, do it, I guess. Awesome, thanks. So we only have a couple of minutes left. I just want to share a couple um, comments from uh, Carly Joe's Morales. Um, oh. Yeah, so he says there's something about languages like Portuguese and Spanish, um, like the possibility of creating images with new words, mm -hmm. um, which I think is a nice comment and something to kind of chew on and think about. And he also said, um, Kayla is such a fine teacher. I was in a workshop given by her about writing poetic prose. So take her classes. <laughs> um, and he didn't know that that was your first book. So. <laughs> LOL. Um, wants to pop in a quick question on the YouTube um, comments. That's where they're generated for us. Um, but. Emily says this was a perfect pairing to create such beautiful works in collaboration. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> it's very excited about the results of that. Okay. <laughs> there might not be any questions, but um, thank you both so much. Uh, thank you also to Dan and Ali for being a part of this evening. Um, and yeah, we should all get together and um, share a glass of wine and, and talk Absolutely. more about how we're gonna keep working together. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nandi, as well, and um, everyone for attending. We really appreciate uh, your attention on this Wednesday evening. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you.